guys, it's Cassie I. Wasson with the Power of Three with Remax Real Estate Lethbridge, and I am here with my grandfather, Tony Birch, who is also a realtor with Remax and has been a licensed real estate agent since 1976. That's right. Yes. So for all of you that don't know, I am a third generation real estate agent. My dad's also a realtor, and Joanne, who is also in the Power of Three, is my aunt. So. We have all followed in the footsteps of my grandpa, and he's going to tell us uh, how he made the decision to start selling real estate back in the 70s. Okay, uh, it's it actually quite interesting how this all happened. Um, my dad and I had a farming operation, we used to Tabor, and we decided in about 90 cents back to sell the operation. so. I listed it with uh, an agent out of Lethbridge, and I won't mention his name because it's another story. Uh, another real estate company out of Lethbridge. But anyway, uh, uh, it was listed for in the springtime. And then, uh, uh, about, if I remember right, June or July, I get a phone call uh, from this agent in Lethbridge asking me if I'm going to be home that day. And I said, Sure, I'll be home. Why? because he's got some people coming through from Ontario who are interested in looking at my place. And since we lived on the highway, on number three highway, they're coming, they're coming through by car from Ontario and they would stop in and talk to me. Sure, that's fine. So uh, that did happen that afternoon. They stopped by and we had a good chat. Matter of fact, they were very interested in my operation and so we showed them around. I showed them around the, the lands and the crops and the, the feedlot that my dad and I had for operation and so on. We talked for quite a while. And then they left and went to Lethbridge. And that was fine. I didn't think nothing of it. And then the next day, the agent phones again. He says, those guys want to come out and look at it. Do you, do you mind? I said, no, send them out. That's fine. So they come out again the next day and we looked at it again with uh, driving around the crops and so on. They were, they were again, they were very impressed with my operation. And so uh, we had a good long talk at that time. And finally, uh, after a few hours, they went back into Lethbridge, stayed at the motel in Lethbridge. Uh, and then the next morning, I get a phone call from the agent that they made an offer on my operation. So oh, that's nice. Uh, so anyway, the, uh, the next day he comes out with the offer, this, this agent. And it was it was low, so we countered back at, at that offer. And we went back and forth actually a few times, and finally we come to a settlement. We made a, we made a deal with these people from Ontario. So uh, they were going to take over, uh, if I remember right, middle of middle of March of '75. Uh, that's not right because I showed it to them later in March. So anyway, in some in '75, when we made a we made a deal and they were going to take over and uh, consequently that was okay and then we made the deal work and then Loris wrote the offer, uh, had the offer signed by us and so we now have a deal. So then I called back to the agent and I said, look, now what are we do with this commission? I know you're charging me a commission for this, but you didn't do nothing for this deal. I did it all. I showed it to him twice. Uh, I think we should have a little break on the commission and he would not do that for me. So we had a good discussion, him and I, and uh, but that's another story. And uh, finally I says, okay, that's, if that's what it has to be, it has to be. So it was. He stuck to his guns and I had to pay full commission on the, on the deal. And he didn't do nothing at all to earn this money. So that's when I thought, no, this is something is not right here. Meantime, mom and I, Cassie's grandma, Joanne's mother, my young wife of 55 years, we decided we're going to go on a trip. Uh, and in the middle of middle of 76 sometime, we decided to go to uh, uh, Tahiti and over to uh, Hawaii and New Zealand. And we went on a trip. So we landed in, in Los Angeles. And there we boarded a plane for Tahiti. And it just happened right beside me. There's a real estate agent there from France. And now, as you probably know, France uh, it's part of, Tahiti's part of France. So he was flying over to France and he had a briefcase with him. So I asked him uh, what he does for a living. He told me he sells real estate in Tahiti and also in France. 
So he said, matter of fact, you see this case I got with me? I said, yeah. He said, it's full of cash from France. I said, what? I said, I'm taking over the, the money this guy from France is buying this piece of property in Tahiti, and I have a briefcase. Now, those days you could do that. <laughs> yeah, I was going to say that couldn't happen anymore. anymore. Yeah. You couldn't, but those days you could do that. So uh, on the way over to Tahiti, it was about a 12-hour flight from L.A., and I thought, well, this, you know what, this might be a good way for me to make a living. So on the way on a trip, I thought about this a long time. Always for the next two weeks we were gone. On the way back, I said to my young wife, I said, you know what, I think I'm gonna sell real estate. She said, you are? I said, yeah, I believe that's the thing for me. He said, these guys are making all this money selling real estate and do bugger all for it. I sold a farm, I had to pay full commission to this broker in Lethbridge. And uh, what the hell, why should I, why should I not take part of this action? So anyway, that's how we got started in some real estate. So you I wanted did. to change things and be provide a service that you weren't given. Exactly, and you know, the, the situation was that uh, uh, in a farming operation, I had experience in, in corn and sugar beets and cattle and everything else, so I thought, well, I'd be, I'd be really like to sell, if I could, farms and ranches and so on, because I'd have got the experience. So that helped me a lot as I, went, as I moved ahead. So uh, um, my young wife was really worried about what I'm going to do because I was only uh, just a young guy at that time. Uh, she said, you're too young to you? Well, what is that, about 35, I think, okay. in the 30, late 30 someplace. Yeah. She said, you're too, too young to retire. And I said, don't worry about it. I'll figure this out. And so that's how I started in real estate. And uh, I learned lots of hard lessons from other, other realtors that uh, – uh, I didn't trust too much, but I mean, it was a good, good experience for me to work with other realtors. And uh, here I am, some real estate even to this day. Yeah. Specializing in farms and ranches. I did sell a bunch of houses. We, lived, we moved to Tabor at that time. So uh, the Tabor market was pretty good for me, and we sold a lot of houses. And that's where Tabor area, we had a ranch on there, and that's where I raised my three girls. Right. So you did do residential, but now you mostly focus on farms. Yeah, because I give the business of the, if someone comes up for housing, people still call me and then I, I call Joanne or I call Cassie and they take over the housing business. And then we have my daughter Sherry here, she's a mortgage girl, so she works quite well in the business also. Mm -hmm. So what was it like back then to sell a house? Was it, like I know there's lots of paperwork and everything now and there's lots of different rules. Big time rules changes a lot. In those times, I can, uh, in order for me to sign up a listing with one page, uh, offer to purchase with one page. Very simple. Now you got pages up to what, 10, 13 pages? Mm -hmm. All kind of papers to work after that. And a handshake probably meant you had a deal. Yeah. I, uh, so, you know, selling real estate, I'm glad you brought that up, Cassidy. Selling real estate, uh, the way I used to do it, you mentioned the handshake. Did a lot of a lot of uh, offers in the Tabor area, especially, and uh, I had only one deal of all my all my years of selling real estate, 47, 45, whatever it's been. I only had one deal where the person backed out. Otherwise, the rest of them all went together for me. And remember about the we used to do one dollar deposits. Yeah, it's another And then story. that changed. Then it, it, we had to up it. So we upped it to $100. $100. <laughs> yeah, that's true. Now people want $5,000. I remember sending in our deals and we had a loony or a dollar. Like, yeah. Yeah, that's And right. interest rates. What were interest rates like back then? Interest rates are terrible. So the, uh, uh, about 1978, the Alberta government came out with a program for farmers. It was called the Beginner Farm Loan. And they would finance the farms up to $200,000 uh, with almost nothing down. I sold a lot of farms for $200,000 with $1 down. The rest of it, $199,999 financed. As long as the dad, the young fellow who was buying a farm, co-signed and helped him out with the machinery. So that was in the late 70s. Then about 81 when the, hit the fan. <laughs> I did. <laughs> I told him he has to watch his language. <laughs> And it hit the fan. Uh, 81, I think, it started the high interest rate policy. And um, a lot of those farmers who did buy 
at that land at 200000 a quarter. Uh, couldn't make it because their, their operating loans were expensive because of interest rates. And uh, there were a lot of foreclosures at that time. Uh, in many, many cases, as a matter of fact, because the dad co-signed, he lost his farm also. So that was, that was quite an experience at that time. Um, just to tell you uh, how bad it was, the rates. I myself personally in 1978, I believe it was, we, my wife and I bought a, an apartment complex in Lethbridge. And I uh, put down $250,000. The deal was, uh, I think, around $3 million. Um, uh, Canada Trust, if you remember right, had a first mortgage on it for a million dollars. The second mortgage on there for nine hundred thousand, and I put down two hundred fifty thousand cash. So then, in nineteen eighty two, my mortgage on the second mortgage ran out. I had to renew it, nine hundred thousand dollars, which I didn't have. So I got stuck with that at the new rates, twenty two percent. Holy! I was paying on nine hundred thousand dollars, and uh, that's another story. So I had to work my buns off make enough money in real estate, selling, selling real estate to carry the apartments because the apartments were not carrying themselves. 22%, so and now 20. we're at like what, 2%? Well, it was private money, so I think you get private money for 4 to 5% now. Okay. But in a way, that's, that's another experience. <laughs> but what do you feel like when it's, Dad, you said you were your most busiest at a, a bad time, like when interest rates yeah, I mean, and, and of course, of course, housing was also affected a lot by that time. So, uh, a lot of the contractors in Lethbridge, or, or pardon me, Tabor, were not building, and uh, so this is not right. I thought because in order for me to sell real estate, I have to have product on the shelf. So I started building houses. And I built uh, a plan that was 920 square feet, a two-bedroom by level, uh, with a huge deck off the back, and the deck was what sold the property actually. One car garage was selling those for forty-five thousand dollars, including the lot. And uh, as I was building, they're always pre-sold. I had I never pre-sold them actually, as they, they went about half half built, and people come by and made the offer. So I had I built about forty, fifty houses, and I think if I remember right. Um, but back in the uh, before that happened, yet uh, mortgage rates were. Expensive also in housing. I think they're around 15, 16 percent. But the Alberta government at that time had a program where they can subsidize some of that to raise you can collect it back from the government. So, and there was um, also programs there. First time home buyers, the government would give four thousand dollars, right, for first time home buyers. Yeah, they had yeah good programs. Yeah, that. they did. Mm -hmm. yeah. And that wasn't you didn't have to pay that back or anything. Yeah, it was like a grant. Yeah. yeah. Oh, okay. So. So you've obviously seen many ups and downs with the market, and I don't know if I told you, but Lethbridge sales were down about 50% in April due to COVID-19. So what, so do we always go up? Is this, okay, what's let's, gonna let's, happen? Let's go back a little bit. So when, you, when these tough times come, and it was hard to sell houses, I put together a, a thought in my mind I call it the domino effect. And I would uh, put, a, put together a deal where house number one was moving to house number two, then I had to sell number two at house number three. Down the road when I put together 15 pieces of property and I bought the last piece of property just to make it all happen. So then that one weekend there was 15 movers going back and forth in the town of Tabor. The movers are coming in the front door. The, the, the vendors are moving out the back door. That's another story interesting but you're right I mean so that helped me a lot with uh, the tough market so you have to <laughs> nobody else is doing that yeah you have to think outside of the box right so I've had to do that a couple times even you know at the high time houses would sell and then I've had people who wanted to move to Coaldale um, but had a house in Tabor and either and they just switched houses so yeah. just Trade. to make the deal work so, yeah just that people trade cards we're doing trading except mm -hmm. In that case, what I did with that 15 deal situation, I uh, had to find each of those another residence to move to. Some of them had to move up, some of them wanted to move down. They had to move down. But I put the package together of uh, 15, uh, 15 uh, homes. 
and that worked out quite well. It was quite a weekend, I can see, when they were all moving. Um, other than that, you mentioned there's tough times with Jesse Ferraris. That's another story which I don't want to get into too much because I have my own thoughts about that. I don't like it. Uh, I think it's far fetched. I think the media is blown out of proportion. And I think that uh, I had a talk this morning to a client in, uh, in Nanaimo, BC. And he's telling me that the, the Nanaimo Chamber, Chamber of Commerce, last week had a meeting and they figured that 75% of the businesses will not be open in Nanaimo. That's how bad it is. So mm -hmm. uh, this is no good. No. Um, so will we recover? Oh, sure. Yeah. But for a long time, it will not be the same until people get back on their feet again. And uh, things are affected that way that they, a lot of guys got no jobs. Right. Uh, they, they got laid off because there's nothing happening because they had to shut down. Mm -hmm. That was the rules of the game, shut down your business. Yeah. But just the same thing back in Tabor, remember, because Tabor's big on oil. Remember when, I can't remember what year it was when the oil patch just tanked. Everybody got laid off. There was tons of foreclosures in Tabor. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, and we were, we were really busy at that time in my office with my, with my buddies Joanne and my crew. We were really busy. Well, you always say cash is king. So if you got the cash at the bad times, yeah. you know, there are still people that can buy, right? But we were yeah. also talking about Lethbridge and why it left, we're actually in a good place, though, because yeah, of our it, market, right? Because Lethbridge is very fortunate to be in, a, in an agriculture area. Uh, and I think that I think the farmer is going to be best off in this situation because we have to have food, and so uh, the farmers got to buy equipment and they spend money in the area, mm -hmm. and so consequently that makes it better for some house. But you get into the cities, like, like Calgary, for example, it's not the same. Right. But we're we're fortunate to be in the agriculture area. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Lots of diversity. And all, yeah. our market has always kind of just stayed steady, right? Yes, like, we don't have the big ups, but we don't yeah. have the big downs. So. Exactly. Uh, for our market, you're right, Joanne, and uh, I'm really concerned right now about the cattle business. Uh, you know, feedlot operations are really getting worried about closure of uh, the Cargill plant and the Brooks plant. The beef is backed up in the feedlots, and uh, it's not good at all. But let me go back a little bit to uh, the prices, okay? Uh, the land, when I bought my uh, piece of land in 1971, I paid $200 an acre for this quarter section with water rights. Now they're selling quarter sections up to $2 million to $2.5 million per quarter with irrigation equipment. So you can see how much difference the land, land price have been mm -hmm. just going up a lot over the last years. Yeah. So consequently, again, I can say we're lucky that we live in this type of area because we're so diversified with corn and beets and potatoes and grains and cattle operations, hog operations, chicken operations, you've got everything going here. So we're, we're probably better off than any place else in the, in the country. Mm -hmm. This is the best place to be living in the world today because I don't understand why the whole world is shut down on account of this. That don't make no sense to me. Should I talk any more about that? No, that's okay. <laughs> Well, I was excited to do this interview just because even someone outside of the family, when they found out that Tony Birch was my grandpa, they said back in the day there wasn't a real estate deal that didn't have Tony's name on it and he was a, a legend in the 80s in real estate and you've obviously slowed down now but you're still working harder than you should be. <laughs> yeah, but I have to and you know why. Yeah. So for farms and... Yeah. Commercial and yeah. Yeah. Right. Yeah, so uh, that's how I got to be here at this moment, and that's how I started. And what is your slogan? What can I sell you today? And that's how you've built your career, right? Yeah. And then so you just ask people. Yeah, that's a, that's the situation. Is when they call you, first thing that you usually say to them is, "What can I sell you today?" And how long have you been using that for? Years. Since 1976? <laughs> I can't remember that far back, but I've been using it for years. But people call me for a reason. So I'll ask them, what can I sell you today? Yeah. And then they'll tell me, no, we don't want to sell, we want to buy. Okay, that's nice. What can I, what can I sell you again today? And so okay. then I call farmers who want to sell. Can we sell your place today? Mm -hmm. 
All right. And that's my story. That's your story. Good story. We could sit here for hours. It's very interesting, Dad. Yeah. And I've learned everything from you. So thank I'm you. I'm proud of my family and uh, everybody that's involved with me with real estate is, is uh, doing good. And I'm really proud of you, my kids and my grandchildren. <laughs> Cassie, it's your generation. All right. Well, thanks, guys. Bye, Grandma. Thank you. And uh, we'll talk to you guys later. Sounds good. Okay, thanks. bye.